Hello, everyone. Welcome to season four, episode six of Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health's virtual lecture series. So this is our 31st lecture. My name is Sage Milne, and I'm a research assistant at Gateway Center of Excellence Rural Health and the moderator for the session. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that the land we operate and reside on, Gateway's office is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples and is connected to the dish with one spoon wampum, under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and its resources by the Great Lakes in peace. We also acknowledge the Upper Canada, um, Upper Canada Treaty signed, which include Treaty Number 29 and Treaty Number Five and a Half. We recognize the First Peoples continued stewardship of the land and water as well as the historical and ongoing injustices they face in Canada. We accept responsibility as a public institution and as treaty people to renew the relationship with First Nations, Métis and Inuit people through reconciliation, community service and respect. Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health is a rural health research organization with the mission to improve the health and well-being of rural residents through research, education and communication. We are located in Goderidge, Ontario, and to our knowledge, we are the only rural health research center in Canada governed by community-based volunteers. Our topic for today's lecture is enhancing emergency management in rural Northern Ontario, learning from COVID-19. This lecture will opine on PhD candidate Amanda Mongyon's work with Northern rural municipalities experienced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Amanda is currently studying rural health and well-being at the University of Guelph and puts her learning into practice as the manager of community health at Temiskaming's Health Unit, where she has worked since 2006. And joining her today with as panelists are Carrie Lepondre from the Canadian Red Cross in 2023. She took on the role of Ontario Emergency Management Senior Manager. Uh, manager. <laughs> Her experience has included working on improving support to Indigenous evacuations and being an instructor in emergency management. Wendy Brunetta is a town councillor of Fort Francis, Ontario. Councillor Brunetta sits on various health-related committees with her municipality and has been elected by the Rainy River District Municipal Association to represent the district on Northern Ontario Munici Municipal Association. And finally, Adam Zubak, who has been involved in emergency management with the Canadian Red Cross since 2020. In 2023, Amanda moved into the operations manager role for Northern Ontario. His work includes over, overseeing a team of coordinators who continue to work in their respective regions to build capacity, enhance relationship building, and respond to emergencies. To thank those who are ongoing attendees, we offer certificates at the end of each semester to thank those with perfect attendance, to recognize your commitment to and involvement with this educational series. Once the lecturer is done presenting, we invite participants to ask questions where both the lecturer and panelists will answer those questions. Please feel free to add your questions to the chat box in Zoom. Uh, there's a Q&A if you look down below. A brief disclaimer. The views expressed in this lecture may not necessarily reflect Gateway Center of Excellence in Rural Health views or opinions, but we believe in providing a platform for a range of perspectives and thoughtful discussion. Now I'm going to invite um, Amanda to take over. Thank you so much for that, Sage, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm just sharing my slides for everyone. I'm so pleased to be here to kick off our discussion today on emergency management in rural Northern Ontario. I'd like to thank Gateway for making space for us to explore this topic and to the panelists, Wendy, Carrie, and Adam for taking part. Also a shout out to my mom who is celebrating her birthday today and choosing to spend part of it learning about emergency management. Happy birthday, mom. I'm going to begin by acknowledging the land where I live and work and where I am today. I'm in the city of Temiskaming Shores within the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people, specifically Temiskaming First Nation. My research interests began in this place near where I grew up and where I have worked 
uh, since 2006 in local public health. Now this image gives a taste of what things looked like here last summer when smoke from forest fires elsewhere in the north affected our air quality. This is ice buildup during the spring thaw in Lake Temiskaming in 2019. Not a great picture, but it gives you a sense of the flash flooding that happened also during a spring thaw, I believe, in 2021. And some flash flooding this past October uh, in a local grocery store. And some very large hail and an example of what it can do to your house. And we've only recently had to develop an extreme heat warning system here where I work. Now I now have no doubt that each of you can think of situations like these that have played out in your communities. And of course, we're all well aware of the massive amounts of snow that have fallen in Eastern Canada over the past few days. Now, each of these circumstances didn't necessarily constitute an emergency, but they signal the potential for one. And they're increasing in frequency and severity, often layering on top of one another. And they represent events that put a strain on our resources, to our physical and mental health. And this makes them a very important consideration if we're trying to build healthy rural communities. Now I'm going to begin by laying some groundwork about why this matters, about how health is shaped and how health is impacted by change or disruption, especially in rural communities. Then I'll share some preliminary findings from a research project that is exploring the experiences of rural communities here in Northern Ontario during the COVID pandemic to try and identify ways that we can learn and grow and enhance their ability to respond in future uh, events. So two important points to get us started. First, that health is created in local communities. And second, that we can't limit our conversations about health to the healthcare sector. In fact, the main conditions for health fall outside of the health sector, which means we really need to work together across sectors if we want to build healthy communities. These two ideas are going to shape much of what we're going to be talking about from here onward. This is a social ecological model, which helps show us the various levels at which health is shaped. What this reminds me is that we really all have a role to play and I'll elaborate. We pay a lot of attention to helping individuals directly, like giving advice on what to eat or how much to exercise and treating illness and injury when they happen. But in fact, so much of our health is shaped at other levels. For example, our relationships with others. That's the inter interpersonal level. And we know that people with strong social connections live longer, healthier lives. Institutions like our schools have an influence on our health. The design of our communities influences, for example, whether we choose to walk or drive, which in turn then also affects some of the other levels like individual health or even ecosystem health, even our relationships with one another. And government policies and the commercial landscape that we build up in society also influences people's eating patterns, their income levels and their access to education and the environments we live in, the natural environments affect the air we breathe, the quality of our water, the stability of our communities, vulnerability to flooding and so on. For many people, especially indigenous people, ecosystem health is integral to culture, to nutrition, to lifelong education, and therefore to their overall well-being. So both the character of each of these levels and then how resilient each of them is can affect the health of the people in our communities. Now let's look at how these play out in rural communities specifically. In Canada in 2021, 18% of the population lived in areas with fewer than a thousand people. As we increase to communities with 10 or even 30,000 people, which many still consider to be rural, this percentage increases to as much as 29% and the population of rural Canada is growing. These rural Canadians do not have the same experience as their urban counterparts. Their older populations face digital service and physical isolation. Our internet is more expensive. There are fewer services and more barriers to accessing them. 
and we're generally farther apart from each other. Now, rural Canadians overall report poorer health outcomes. But we exhibit some positive traits as well, like increased social cohesion and lower rates of depression compared to urban areas. Now, if we add COVID to the mix, of course, health and well being were impacted across Canada, and not just related to the virus itself, but other aspects of our health. But in rural communities, each of these impacts was amplified or at least experienced differently. In other words, emergencies like COVID have significant impact on the health of rural communities. Impact that is often due to pre-existing conditions like social isolation, inadequate income, and more. Now change or disruption has a significant impact on our lives. I'll now share a bit about what the literature says about this. First, our communities are always in flux. Change can happen gradually or it can happen suddenly, taking shape as a disaster. Rural communities are close to nature and this puts us on the front lines of the impacts of climate change. And our distance from urban centers can affect our ability to respond when an emergency hits. And when emergencies happen, we often talk about community resilience. That's the idea of bouncing back after any sort of disruption. And this is especially true following large scale disruptions like a flood or a rock slide. But emergencies often last much longer than that initial event. With COVID, for example, things continued for years. And with the slow evolution of emergencies like climate change, we often reference instead of just resilience, also a need for adaptation. But again and again, emergencies expose how vulnerable we are if we don't adequately address some of those underlying issues at multiple levels in society that affect people's access to health. Both the pandemic and the pandemic response had a bigger effect on people with lower income, with pre-existing health issues, with poor access to internet. These issues are complex, but they are preventable. And there are conditions that we don't want to bounce back to. So resilience or even adaptation for these issues may not be the answer. Now for COVID, we call this a syndemic. And that's where an infectious disease epidemic collided with an epidemic of social inequalities. And I've recently heard the global situation more at, accurately called uh, polycrisis. So that's where massive disruptions are happening all around the globe at the same time but the impacts all show up at the local level. Now, the types of societal changes needed to address these vulnerabilities ask us to go beyond resilience and beyond adaptation to transformation. And this means engaging in deep learning and reflection as individuals and as a society to then invest in making big change possible. And if we do that well, that deep learning, the thinking about how we're governing, investing in change, then we can engage in transformative governance. The idea is that we're working together to really change our systems into something better. Now, today's lecture is about emergency management. And what do we mean by that? First, an emergency is a situation, a dangerous situation with potential to harm people or property. And it can be caused by nature, by disease or other health risks or by an accident. And we use the phrase emergency management to talk about emergencies and how we act before, during, and after them. A commonly used model is this emergency management cycle with five phases from prevention, mitigation, preparedness, and response to recovery. So to recap this first bit, health is created at the local level. It's influenced more broadly, but the magic happens right where we live. Health is shaped across sectors and across levels of society. Rural communities make up a significant part of Canada. People in rural areas have different health outcomes and this can make them in some ways more vulnerable to change, but in also in other ways more resilient. And change is constant and therefore an important component of how we think about community health. And many of the impacts of emergencies are rooted in some underlying issues that call for a combination of resiliency, adaptation, and transformation. So I hope this background is helpful to now how we're going to think about the research, and I'll get into that now. 
This is a two-year project funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and it has three phases focused on the experience of seven rural Northern Ontario communities. In this research, first we took some time to learn about each municipality's experience during the pandemic by reviewing their council packages from early January 2020 until June 2022. So that's waves one through six of the COVID pandemic. This led to key informant interviews with staff and elected officials. And then because public health was such an important part of this particular emergency, we're also interviewing local public health units. And then we're going to bring everyone together in a participatory workshop so that collaboratively we can identify ways to strengthen local communities' response to future disruptive events. Complete findings will be presented in several ways, including a report and a policy brief. And today I'm going to share with you preliminary findings from the municipal interviews. Now to give you a sense first of the region we're talking about, Northern Ontario is typically divided right above where I've added a black line in the image here. And here we're reminded that Northern Ontario covers 90% of Ontario's land mass with only 6% of the population. We have more chronic disease and we live an average two and a half years less than in the South. We have fewer doctors and our lives are more intensely shaped by issues of weather, infrastructure and location. And to those who might be thinking, only 6%, why so much ado about so few people? I'll say that we know that inequities bring us all down. So when some people in our population are doing less well, it affects everyone. And then also Northern Ontario is the source of resources that benefit the province as a whole. So when this part of the province can thrive, everyone is better off. Now I'll share with you the findings um, organized into four buckets of ideas. First, there are very perspectives on the phases of emergency management. There's some consistency around thoughts around preparedness and response phases of the cycle, but less so on other phases like prevention, mitigation, and recovery. Also perspectives about who has a role in each of these phases really varies. For example, is it the role of the municipality to mitigate impacts of the emergency for businesses or for community groups? And the context municipalities are working in includes other levels of government. It includes many sectors and civil society and figuring out who does what or who gets involved will depend on the type and the scale of the emergency. There is good consensus on the value in general though of other organizations working together and in the case of COVID, that was largely local public health. Other enablers that came out of this include things like clear communication and trusted information, the funding support from other levels of government and the technology upgrades that happened during the pandemic were, were notable silver linings. Second, the things that affect municipalities go beyond their borders from supply chain to increasingly wide availability of information to the economic influences. Rural communities are not functioning in, in a bubble. They're affected by everything around them. And similarly, the risks and vulnerabilities, these also often come from outside the local area. The third main finding is how distinct rural is. As we discussed earlier, rural communities are very different. Their governance structure is small and nimble and well integrated within the community. Their approach to emergency management is also unique in each community. Rural communities have strengths that can help them respond and cope when things happen and informal ways to communicate that really effectively reach many people. It was often felt that as well, policies within the COVID pandemic were much more in tune with the needs of urban centers or with the needs of Southern Ontario than they were for Northern rural communities. And lastly, so much of what happened in relation to COVID depended on the individuals involved. So this included the relations that they have, relationships that they have with others and how trusted they were in their community their personal knowledge, their levels of health literacy. So for example, how they understood how the infectious disease spread, how the vaccines work, and how, um, as well as their political ideology. So this research is led by University of Guelph's Dr. Leith Deacon, who I expect many who attend these lectures often will know, as well as Dr. Kate Mulligan from the University of Toronto and myself. 
We're grateful to the individuals and the organizations who have supported the project at various stages, as well, of course, as those who are participating in this project. And thanks to the panelists for joining so that we can build on these early findings through discussion. In a moment, we'll move to the panelists, but first I wanna recap some of the main ideas that I hope to leave you with. I'll re reiterate some of the things I said early on. Health manifests in the local community. Rural communities are not only distinct from urban ones, but also different one from the next. So they need tailored localized approaches in what we do. Next, things are always changing. And how we acknowledge, prepare for, and respond to that change is an integral part of a community's health. This research is highlighting opportunities to build clarity around the emergency management cycle, around the roles. It's helping us think about rural communities within a much larger context, reminding us of the need to support them though in locally appropriate ways, and not to forget the importance of trusting relationships. There's more to come as the project progresses, and I'm happy now to be able to move to hear from each of our panelists. So I will stop sharing and um, move to introduce Wendy, Councillor Wendy Brunetta from the town of Fort Francis and also supporting the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association um, to share your comments, Wendy. Thanks, Amanda. Very happy to be here uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, how emergencies affect uh, our local municipalities. So as mentioned, I'm a municipal councillor in a small Northern Ontario community. Our population is approximately 7,600. Um, I'm currently in my third term, beginning my 10th year. And in that short period of time, our community has seen two floods, one drought and a pandemic. So uh, these emergencies impact municipalities economically, structurally, and in terms of the availability and disbursement of staff. So when your community is faced with an emergency situation, everything else gets put on hold. I've always said the reason I ran for council a third time is because uh, my second term was basically just focusing on emergencies the entire time. So when that happens, very little else can be accomplished. So through my council role, I was also appointed to several local health related committees. I'm on the local physician recruitment and retention committee, the local community clinic board, and the Northwestern Health Unit, which I am co-chair, sorry, vice chair. Uh, each of these committees was significantly impacted, of course, by the COVID pandemic. And my role was to assist the committees in making decisions that would support the COVID response efforts in conjunction with the directions of the Provincial Medical Officer of Health. At times, it was very difficult. We had we faced decisions like, should we be terminated in employees who won't be vaccinated? Um, there was also mixed messages coming from the province. So many times we didn't know which way we should go on, on certain issues. At other times, I witnessed the compassion and willingness of community members to volunteer at vaccination clinics. However, as the pandemic dragged on, I really saw the fatigue and withdrawal from some of those things as well. So through my role as an appointee to the Northern Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association, I was appointed to a provincial advisory table where we make recommendations to the Ministry of Health, as well as assist in the development of a local and regional response to our physician shortages. Emergencies and surrounding committees also affect or have a huge impact on, on our home communities. In the North, we have many First Nation communities that are very remote. And when it becomes necessary to evacuate those communities, the province looks to closer municipalities to host evacuating community members. Unfortunately, we're not always able to accept or support those evacuees because of our limited infrastructure. So often in our area, these evacuees are sent to larger centers such as Winnipeg or Thunder Bay. And sometimes, unfortunately, families are split up and may go to a number of different communities for extended periods of time. Finally, I'd like to explain why rural Northern Ontario is different from Southern Ontario. So in Ontario, there are three types of municipalities, upper tier, which it refers to a county or region, lower tier, which is more local and single tier. 
So Southern municipalities follow the upper tier, lower tier format. Upper tier municipalities often coordinate services delivered between municipalities in their area or provide area-wide services. In many cases, services are assigned by legislation to upper or lower tier municipalities, either exclusively or non-exclusively. Waste management is a good example. So certain upper tier municipalities are exclusively responsible for waste management matters, except for waste collection, which would be done by the local municipality. Ability can be shared by both levels of government. Um, both upper tier and lower tier municipalities, for example, can provide things like parks and other recreational um, facilities. In Northern Ontario, all municipalities are single tier. This is because much of the geographic area of Northern Ontario is not organized for municipal purposes. These unorganized areas, also referred to as unincorporated territories, are not municipalities. In the North, there are currently 10 district social service administration boards, uh, shortened to DSABs, that are designated as service managers providing certain services such as social assistance and childcare to both municipalities and unincorporated territories. So when an emergency occurs, if it impacts the district or region, upper tier municipalities in the south, or sorry, upper tier municipalities in the south and district social service administration boards in the north would largely be involved. And if the emergency impacts just at the local level, then lower tier municipalities in the south and northern single tier municipalities would be involved. And truthfully, even in regional circumstances, all of the impacted communities would be involved along with the DSAB. So that's about uh, enough about uh, government. <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy, and for offering that context. Um, I think what the difference, that structural difference between the North and the South is, I think, likely not well known. And uh, thank you for highlighting that, because I think it'll probably come back into our discussion about who plays a role and how do we do things that are province wide. Uh, we'll move now to Carrie and Adam from the Canadian Red Cross, who are going to um, share some reflections as well today. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Wendy uh, and Amanda, for being part of this panel. Adam and I greatly, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as mentioned, I've been with Canadian Red Cross since 2013, and uh, I'll be get, sharing some reflections on some of my role and how we've seen things change uh, in Red Cross. I'm going to quickly share my screen. Please let me know if this works. works. We see your whole screen. Okay. Um, we do take a collaborative approach when we are working with our municipal partners. Um, I, we, I wanted to start with just giving a little bit of background to the Canadian Red Cross. Um, I'm just going to... About us, our mission uh, you know, we help people in communities in Canada around the world in times of need and support them in strengthening their resilience. Um, we are not intending to replace or take over anything that the municipalities are providing or other community partners are providing, but also but to work collaboratively with those partners, with those municipalities um, in strengthening their own resilience. Uh, our vision is as the leading humanitarian organization through which people voluntarily demonstrate their caring for others in need. So the majority of our supports come from our volunteer teams, uh, which are led by team members such as Adam and his, his team across the North. Some of what we do, and I'll leave this slide to Adam, Sure. Thanks, Carrie. So this slide just kind of identifies how the Red Cross um, scales disasters, super high level, um, minor and major disasters. Generally, we scale it based on the, the number of, of pe people 
affected, uh, how many how many resources are, are needed for assistance and duration. So you'll see there that a minor event is up to 25 people or 10 dwellings within a community. And for that, um, the Red Cross is able to provide assistance for basic needs for up to 72 hours. This is, is generally what you may think of for the Red Cross for a house fire or something localized, for example. So we're able to step in, provide that support for, for individuals affected by, by something like a house fire uh, and allow them that buffer zone to, to kind of recover and establish resources um, for the future to get back up on their feet. And those resources are available 24 seven, 365 at a toll free number. Anyone within Ontario can call that line at any time of the year and be put in contact with someone who's going to help them organize uh, assistance and get them set up for, for those 72 hours. For a major event, uh, obviously more than 25 people or 10 dwellings, uh, and can be within, you know, uh, in terms of scope, anything from a high rise apartment building to a couple neighborhoods to maybe even beyond, right? Depending on the the event that, that is being supported. And the main difference for this, despite uh, other than obviously the, the scope is we work with local municipal and community partners to kind of get, to get an agreement in place that's gonna determine exactly what the Red Cross is going to be doing, what kind of services we're gonna be providing on behalf of the local authority. Uh, important to note that the Red Cross we operate on on a um, on a request basis, so we don't impose ourselves. Uh, just because there's a disaster happening, we don't simply show up and, and take charge of anything. We are we are requested in um, whether it's a municipal partner or a community partner, uh, or even sometimes a, uh, a another agency who's who's already doing some work in there. And, uh, and from there, we make sure that we don't duplicate any services is the big part, is we want to make sure that we're providing uh, effective assistance while not duplicating services or, con you know, confu making a confusing situation even worse. So as Adam mentioned, um, again, with a minor event, this is where engagement in the local level with volunteers, uh, that communication amongst all parties is very key to know we, we're not looking to overlap or to, as Adam point uh, made a point of saying to take over any existing service but to supplement where we can um, and when we can. With that, um, um, one of the things that we've done is very community driven supports. There are, you know, the community which Act, whether it's a single member of the community who's being impacted or larger scale, where the community is actually activating us. And this is where CRC operations from an emergency management standpoint, we determine, is it appropriate for us? Are we the right team to support? If, we're, if we don't feel we are, then we will refer and connect, help facilitate a connection with other nonprofits or other NGOs who may be more appropriate given the scope of work or request that's being received from the community. In addition to that, we had already been starting pre-COVID to build what we call our CRC health team, our health and emergency team. However, COVID expedited that development. As you know, many of you are aware, you know, we worked with local health units, local social service boards to help provide uh, vaccination clinics, check-ins and supports to long-term care homes. In the pan pandemic uh, period of time that we're in now, the evolution is we're recognizing that given the vulnerable population and higher risk that we see across not only Ontario, but Canada, there's still a high need and we've maintained and, and continue to grow and develop our health and emergency team, which includes uh, mental health and protection services, um, social psychosocial supports as well. And very, we're very committed to truth and reconciliation and our pathway and recognizing our, our traditional territories and the traditional owners of the land that we reside upon. Through that, we have committed uh, 
to the development and expansion of our Canadian Red Cross Indigenous Peoples Team, both at the national and geographical levels. We work a lot with Indigenous Services Canada, as well as directly with communities across the North, where you know it could be in community support, it could be commun com supporting communities when they're evacuated to other communities, um, through disaster re reduction and resilience, all the way to emergency response. A key element of that, as always, is our building a capacity with our municipal host partners. And again, sometimes we come in and we do several service deliverables. Other times it's only one or two. It's all driven by our municipal host partners. And at the end of the day, of course, linked into that as our government partners, whether it's the province of Ontario or the federal government of Canada. So that's just some higher level overview of some of what we do. And as mentioned, if there's any questions, please use the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer them as fulsome as we possibly can. Where we're not able to, we'll definitely loop back to Amanda to provide her with the responses as appropriate. Thank you so much, Carrie and Adam. So this is where now we can move to our interactive portion of today's event and uh, really appreciate the questions that have been coming into the Q&A. So if you have reflections that you'd like to share, um, if anything that we've shared resonates with you or um, causes you to pause or um, makes you want to learn more, please put it in the, in the Q&A. We'll try to get to all of the questions that you have today. Um, and I will look to that now. And the first question comes from Brian, who is saying, given that he's referencing that social ecological model that I shared earlier with all the levels that have a role in shaping health, Given that in the model society and simultaneously uh, simultaneously impacts the and, and government simultaneously impacts the ecosystem and healthcare, is society the place where effective action for health is that where our energies need to go at the society level? So, um, Wendy, do you want to maybe start a response to that question? Um, where do you think we need to intervene most importantly? Yeah, I think. Um municipalities are are driven by funding primarily you know so we and and in small municipalities we have very limited funding so um the questions often come up you know is this a health issue like should someone in the health sector be addressing this or should it be a municipal response um and often we end up doing it jointly. So um, in terms of the COVID response, of course, the health unit was primarily in our area, the, uh, the organization that took responsibility for all of the COVID clinics and recruiting volunteers. And um, of course, all of the board members on the health unit board are municipal representatives. So there's that really uh, tight connection between um, you know, health and and uh, municipal governments. So I think it's a joint response. I, I hope that answered the question. I, I feel like it's uh, none of us really wash our hands and walk away and say, no, that's your job. You know, it, it really is something that we consider um, to be the responsibility of both sectors. Carrie or Adam, do you want to add to that? I think uh, I agree with what Wendy is saying, and uh, I, if I understand your question, Brian, um, it is simultaneous because with the changes in health and climate change that we're seeing impacting um, the visuals that you provided, Amanda, really emphasized some of that as well, um, is that interconnectivity between ecosystem and health. Um, and do I think is society the place where effective action for healthcare for energies? I think that it's one direction that for us to focus our energies. Um, as Wendy indicated, you know, not only are the the ripple effect of things interconnected, but so are our systems, probably more so than many people realize. Um, you know, just to add into a bit of what went build on what Wendy was talking about. 
And to, to build off of that, Carrie, um, you know, as someone who's been on, on the ground for a number of, of responses during the, especially during the pandemic side, um, what generally happens is there is a, a group put together, like an action group put together from all the, the parties that are involved um, in providing support to the particular community that's affected. And they are from every level of government to community supports, to NGOs, to, um, you know, just people within the community themselves. So it, it really does take everyone working simultaneously together to tackle some of these problems. And if one of those building blocks is missing, you you 100% notice it and and it has to get addressed right away. Otherwise your approach is is not gonna be as effective as it should be. Yeah, thanks for that, everybody. I, I agree as well. And, you know, in that back to that same model, as we move out to those outer circles, the, the scale and the complexity of whatever we're talking about just increases and increases. So in some ways, it's so much more straightforward to do things at the individual level. And therefore, we often put a lot of energy there because we want to be effective and we want to get stuff done and we want to see results. Um, and so the work that needs to happen at the societal level is really hard and really complex and we don't have the answers on how to do it a lot of the time. Uh, but I do, I do think, and I think others who work especially in public health will agree that that's where a lot of the, the change needs to happen. And then the impact is so much greater when we can make a change at the societal level, then it just benefits so many people, but it only happens through collaboration, which is not easy. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of trust. And so, uh, I would say, yes, we need to, that is where we need to be focusing our energies for the most part, um, without forgetting about all the other parts as well. Um, another question in the chat, uh, I'm jumping down to a question from uh, Michaela and Brian sort of touch on similar things. So this is um, for Adam and Carrie, Rick cost related. So the first question is, what are the notable psychological impacts of these overlapping crises and how prevalent is PTSD among Red Cross um, staff and volunteers? And then the follow up, the, the next question from Michaela also touches on PTSD and mental health um, needing to be addressed. So um, Adam and Carrie, would you like to speak to those, those two questions? Sure, I, I'll, I'll go for just Carrie. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's it's a compounding of just kind of, of one one event after another that you you really do start to see the 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 impact in especially on on those who are are frontliners, right? Um, the volunteers for the Red Cross, especially, you know, they they give anywhere from two to three weeks at a time if they're on a a larger scale deployment, and between. Uh, pandemic protocols and the complexities of of a, just a, a major event in general that's a lot to deal with over 21 days uh so as site managers and and operations managers we've really put a lot of effort and and guidelines in place focusing on the mental health of those who are of the helpers uh for for lack of a better better term you know um our, our people can't help those who need it if they themselves aren't can't take care of themselves and, and aren't watching themselves. So, you know, whether it's regular check-ins, uh, resources for, for Red Cross personnel, just to make sure that they don't burn themselves out, making um, resources available for them to, to reach out and say, hey, I'm having a rough time. Can I, can I take a break? Or even just to share those feelings and those challenges that they're, that they're running up against during a very, you know, at the best of times, a stressful situation has been at the forefront of, of Red Cross operations. And as far as I can tell, Carrie, it'll be, continue to be as we see more compounded events in the future. Yeah, just to build on that. And Michaela, thank you for mentioning. Yes, I was, I was fortunate to be at DEMCON this year. And, and even with the Northwest Response Forum, that Adam is a, a member of the panel there. Um, the focus very much, especially coming out of COVID, um, the pandemic, and now that people are trying to readjust to the new reality of whatever that, that happens to be, um, there there have been greater strives not only for supporting the individuals that we are there to support, 
with our mental health and psychosocial support team, our psychosocial support responders, but also increasing those uh, tools for our, as Adam said, for our management level responders to help those just volunteer or paid responders who are coming in and majority of, of them are like any other emergency service they they do because they care so they do tend to commit a lot of them themselves their emotional psychological psychological selves to everything that they're doing for the betterment of others so we have to we've been expanding and building on our our tools and our abilities our resources relying on other local resources as well to help us with these things to support those individuals. Um, one, to try to prevent PTSD, but also um, to have an open up opportunity and safe space for those who maybe experience PTSD, that if they feel a trigger, that there are venues for them to go to receive supports. So that's been um, a big piece of our building in, into our training, building into our supports within and, and pre and post response. Uh, and uh, unfortunately with what we're seeing with trending, um, we do expect there to, speed, to see increases as, as we go. And so that's why checkpoints at the local level and at the, the provincial level are so important to us when it comes to that. So I hope that kind of answered between Adam and I, both Brian and Michaela on that. Thank you so much. Um, Wendy, I'm going to look to you for this next question from Roslyn about the recent Roma report about rural health care. Um, I know it talks about encouraging uh, municipalities to be involved in the local Ontario health teams and uh, to be addressing some of the family doctor shortages. And it also talks about uh, protecting local public health and um, other upstream things as well. So would you like to comment on um, on those recommendations from Roma or in general about the in, in greater involvement, the idea of greater involvement for municipalities in the planning and delivery of healthcare. And I guess I just also, that report also really encourages uh, uploading the costs for healthcare that have been borne by municipalities back to the province. So I would appreciate your thoughts on any of that. Yeah, there, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, thanks Rosalyn for that. And thanks for the link to the document. I, I hadn't read it yet, but um, I'm really, there are a number of ways that municipalities can advocate for toward the government. So we do it at the local level, you know, at our local municipality level. Our um, our district associations also do it in terms of resolutions that are sent to the government, various forms, uh, levels of government. And at the Northwestern Ontario uh, uh, Association level as well. So we... Um, at all of these conferences, the Roma conference and the AMO conference, uh, we apply for delegations to speak to ministers. And I have to say in the last 10 years that I've been on council, I would say almost 80% of those conferences in the past 10 years, we have asked for a delegation to the minister of health and we have spoken to these issues that are in this paper. So often we are talking about our, our physician shortage in our region and how much it impacts on the health and quality of life in our communities. So, um, you know, we don't ever, or we haven't really seen a lot of movement. Um, they do um, often let us know that there are changes coming uh, to legislation. There has been a change, of course, you know, with the Ontario health teams. Um, I think municipalities are are um, open to um, applying to be members of the Ontario health team. So I don't think that's been limited in terms of their opportunity to participate. Um, there's just so much, so many other things that we have were spread very thin as well. So um <clears throat> At our recent NOMA meeting, I have to I have to say that uh, one of our members said, "Why are municipalities paying for health related things? This is Ministry of Health, not municipal government." Um, but by the same token, there were people within the within the room that said, "But I still want to be involved." So <laughs> where do you draw the line? You know, um, we've seen 
multiple downloads, not just in health, in a number of areas from the province to the local governments, which increases taxes for our, our, our you know, residents. So <clears throat> I don't know what um, response we have other than it has to stop. We can't afford this anymore. Um, you know, the cost of living is getting out of control for everyone. So, yeah, I I agree with the paper. I agree with many of the things that Rome has put forward. Something we continue to advocate for at our local level as well. Thanks, Wendy. And um, another question from the chat, I'll, I'll just stick with you, Wendy, is from Brian. It's one of the first ones. Um, quoting if you, you that you had said if faced with an emergency everything else gets put on hold so does that hold contribute to an ability to prevent the next in emergency and therefore make it more serious so i think he's speaking to this you know compounding of emergencies that can happen absolutely and um i think the smaller you are the more difficult it is um so we always rely on um a number of you know, people like the Red Cross, we rely on our neighboring municipalities. Uh, we rely on volunteers. There's just, you know, we turn to as many other avenues as we can for support. And and often it's, you know, it helps build up those, those inadequacies. So I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that you know, at some point we may be asked to reciprocate. So obviously we, uh, whenever we're asked to help out we we do so so if we if we can so yeah absolutely these these multiple emergencies uh really put a strain not only on on resources but on our staff you know there there was a time where we had to say you know people need a break we need to stop asking them to work these extended hours and you know just try to start rotating people in and out so that you're not uh burning people out. So yeah, there's there's a lot of things you have to consider. And then Adam, a question to you uh, is about whether you've been able to track, because you spoke about uh, minor and major disasters. So do you have a sense of how, what proportion fall into each of those categories? And in general, are is there an increase in, in all types of disasters? Thanks for that question, Brian. Well, I don't have handy the exact percentage. Um, I can definitely tell you that we're seeing an uptick in activations and requests for assistance uh, throughout the province for all, basically all types of, of disasters. Um, and, and even just in general support, whether it's from an infrastructure failure to house fires, um, even starting to get into requests um, that are a little bit more complex, so like uh, encampments in municipalities and, and just, you know, possibly assisting folks there. Um, but we're def where we're definitely seeing a trend is in those major disasters. Uh, you know, every spring we can be quite confident that there's going to be localized floodings in some communities, especially some of the more northern ones that, uh, that experience it every year. And with the, the hotter, drier summers, we're definitely seeing more intense and longer fire seasons than we have in the past. And mo more alarmingly, I, I would say that we're starting to see uh, an upward trend in those compound disasters or responses, you know, whether it's an infrastructure failure plus a fire or flood or a health emergency plus some, you know, uh, another event going on simultaneously. Um, so it's not, you're not just assisting in one aspect, but you've got this whole other angle to, to deal with at the same time. And uh, our, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie, but our, our trending seems to be in our, our modeling is that it's, we're gonna see more, more requests um, in future years. No, you're right, Adam. Um, we're definitely seeing an increase, um, an, an unfortunate uptake in calls for request, uh, minor, what we class as minor, so individuals contacting us are less than 25, as Adam explained earlier. Uh, we've gone from an average coming into our provincial or, or into our national call center just for Ontario um, from an average of just over 400 calls, some of which are with what we call within mandate and some of which are not uh, per month to over close to 700 calls. 
in a month. Um, once they're filtered through, about a third of those are actually within our mandate. The rest are ones that we're looking to refer either through 211 or to other agencies. And then when we have a larger scale, which is 25 or more, we've seen from 2020 to 2023, we've seen a probably 40% increase in the frequency. We used to have a period of time, and I'm sure Wendy from an admissible level can associate to this. We used to have a period of time in the year that we called our blue sky, uh, where we could focus on resetting, reevaluating, looking for improvements, getting some of that grassroots in the ground work done, uh, and then getting into the next season. We don't have that anymore. We haven't had it since 2020. Um, I miss those days sometimes. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the compound, because now we're working with, um, and not just in the North, but across the province, we're working with, as Adam said, in community for, for water infrastructure failures. Um, when we say fires, it's not just actual forest fire creating it. It's also the health risk to air quality, um, the loss of quality water supply, things like that. So there's definitely an increase in many of those things, as well as requests for support with vulnerable population when it comes to housing and homelessness, as everyone knows, that's a big impact that then also has a ripple effect on your healthcare system and all different layers. Um, so yeah, our data, we do track the data. That's how we do forecasting and we do our, our planning. Uh, so there's definitely a higher demand for sure. Hi. Well, it's coming up to the hour. So as we conclude this lecture, uh, we hope that this proved to be educational and insightful into enhancing emergency response in the community and just the general challenges that come with Northern uh, municipalities um, and also maybe their strengths. Through this lecture series, the Gateway Center of Excellence and Rural Health team strives to better the health and well-being of rural residents through research, education, and communication by really providing a range of topics relevant to rural communities. A big thank you to both our lecturer, Amanda, and panelists, Carrie, Wendy, and Adam. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed listening to this lecture or have an idea on what rural health topic that we should cover next, please fill out the survey. It can be found in the chat box. So not the Q&A, but the chat box. Uh, we appreciate any insight from our audience on what topics are relevant to them. Uh, we would also like to thank our sponsors for their continued support. Without them, the lecture series would not be possible. These include Microwage Basics Goderidge, McGee Motors Goderidge, Libro Credit Union, Lighthouse Money Management Goderidge, McEwen and Fagan Insurance Brokers Goderidge, Huron Telecommunications Cooperative, also known as Huron Tel, Zayers Goderidge, CIBC Wealth Management, and the Goderidge Royal Legion Branch 109. Gateway is a not-for-profit organization with charitable status, and we greatly appreciate and welcome any support we receive. Right now, we are currently accepting resume for summer students uh, to serve as research assistants like myself. If you know a recent graduate or someone who is currently enrolled in a diploma or bachelor's program of health sciences, social sciences, or related field of study, send our, a resume our way at info at gatewayruralhealth.ca. This is a full-time seasonal position that will begin in May, 2024. If you would like to donate to, um, to Gateway to continue to support this lecture series and our other health projects, I encourage you to visit the Gateway website, uh, www.gatewayruralhealth.ca slash donate. If you can follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube and hit the notification bell uh, to be updated when we post or sign up on our website to get email notifications. As you may be aware, February 2nd recently passed and our local groundhog, Wyerton Willie, did not see his shadow predicting an early spring. I am told, however, that Lucy the lobster in Nova Scotia did see her shadow and predicted six more weeks of winter. 
So we have some competition going on between the real weather experts here. Maybe the sun and warm weather will come by by the time we meet for our next lecture on Tuesday, March 5th, 2024 with Leslie Walker, who is discussing artificial intelligence, healthcare and inequality. We hope to see you there. Bye now.